Welcome to the Sisterhood of Sweat. I'm here today with Isabel Kiera. Isabel Kiera is the creator of the life actualization process and has been a guide, mentor, and leader throughout her entire life, studying and working in transformational energy modalities, serving others, whether through entrepreneurial work, culinary prowess, or her professional intuitive guidance. With dedication, Isabel activates unlimited potential and empowerment for her clients, <clears throat> helping them to ignite their full passion and align with their most authentic life path, masterfully supporting the liberation of constricting beliefs, definitions, and self-limitations. As a result, her clients can access a deeper wisdom and joy within their lives and experience a world of prosperity, miracles, and magic. Isabel spends her time exploring her backyard in Connecticut and New York City. Backyards, excuse me. <laughs> in addition to connecting with her deep roots in Italy, she can often be found traveling the globe whether leading a retreat or on a personal pilgrimage. When at home, Isabel is busy with her career as the owner of multiple businesses. Today, we talked about when we aren't in our body and we're disassociating from it as a method of protection how to love not being there yet, reframing what getting there actually means and what success can physically look like, how art intuition is like no one else's and how to tap into your own intuition and trust your gut, why your obstacles <clears throat> are working for you and like I said, Joel Osteen's quote, trouble is your transportation. Learning to experience the source of spiritual energy that's inside of you. And why women are especially good at creating food abusive relationships. Last but not least, we talked about women being the subject of objectification. <clears throat> Sorry, I have to keep clearing my throat today. <clears throat> and uh, also just having body shame and not having good body image. So this has been a power packed discussion today. Uh, I hope you really enjoy it. Without further ado, let's dive into this episode with Isabel. I am very excited to welcome Isabel Chiara to the Sisterhood of Sweat today. How are you, woman? I'm so good. I yeah. love your, I love all your books back there. And I love your the name of your podcast and how you have branded yourself. It's amazing. Oh, thank you so much. And you know, that all happened during a rough time in my life. <laughs> <laughs> what better time yeah that's that's the gift right sometimes the obstacles are the gift that we don't feel like is a gift at the time mm -hmm. but if we were to look back over you know and connect all the dots like Steve Jobs says we would realize that that each experience and obstacle took us to where we are now so right. and you really speak to obstacles but before we get to that point uh which we're going to bring up in, the, in a little bit I just want you to the audience to get to know you a little bit and what makes you tick and what your why is how did you get started in this space and just your backstory so I don't, I don't really know if it's a backstory. I think it's a front story too. <laughs> um, so I come from a family that loves food 
and um, honors food and focuses on food. And so food has been my life. And um, I wrote this book, Eat Your Words, not really intending for anybody to really read it. Um, I just thought I had a book in me and I always was journaling, you know, my feelings, my feelings about food. And it's really about the, uh, my relationship with food and how it's um, taking charge of my life for most of my life. And um, it, it always felt an uncontrollable um, urges to eat, binge, we can, we'll call it binge. And um, so it was, but it was something, you know, I would never discuss with anybody. I mean, everybody, you could, I would say, oh, I just ate a lot or, but never talk about it as if, if it were a problem as if it were something that I couldn't control in, in any way. I didn't want anyone to know that I, um, that this was something that consumed me, right? Like, food, like the whole experience was consuming to me. Um, but, you know, on the outside, I was, you know, happy. <laughs> as long as I had food, I was happy. And so um, I decided during, during COVID, I uh, began to write this book and get serious about the book and really looking, really taking a hard look uh, at the reasons, what was, what was triggering me, what the words were. Um, but uh, again, I wasn't ready to come full out. So I created um, my book and it's called Eat Your Words. I actually have it right here. I love and the cover. It's, <laughs> I know, I love the cover too. And thank you. And um, I decided to uh, do it in a third, in, as a character. And the name of the character in the book, her name is Gianna Giovanni, because through her, anything was possible. Was able, I was able to speak about anything, right? And really bring home a lot of the feelings and the concepts and what was really, um, really bothering me, right? Like, you know, my life looked really good on the outside. <laughs> You know, I made, I would create, you know, as like studying cre um, how to create manifesting. And I was able to really, um, you know, create a lot of abundance in my life. But this thing, <laughs> this relationship with food was the struggle that would, you know, kind of kick me in the butt <laughs> all the time. Um, and so... I decided to talk about it through this character. Um, but, you know, I've come full circle after about a year of it, this being out, this book being out and really come kind of forward with the real message because the real message is um, I'm not the only one in this, in this boat. And I think it's a real serious uh, issue that, you know, a lot of people have. And I think there are a lot of ways to um, really look at it. And the, the goal of this book itself was to just come forward with the story so that people can relate to the story so they could look at themselves within the story because it's not really just my story, right? It's, everybody has a similar story, you know? It's so, like having an alter ego, like how Todd Herman's book talks, it's the alter ego. And many times we can be who we want to be, that we're afraid to be, or say the things that we really think by being this superhuman alter ego. Exactly. Yeah, you, that's true. Um, so, right. So that's the, the, the character of this person is she could say anything. She has a very flippant attitude. She has a very flippant attitude about food also. And, you know, no big, you know, her, some of her words are like, ah, oh, no big deal. You know, I'll just have, you know, Doritos or no big deal. I'll just have a sandwich. I'll feel better, you know, but actually it's just the food itself um, was, you know, she was trying to live, uh, you know, live her life that her, you know, ideal life, <laughs> which is always, it's always our goal, right? To, to feel great and live our ideal life. There's always these obstacles that present themselves and uh, food happens to be the one du jour, so, the food du jour. <laughs> have you had to put, <clears throat> eat your words in a nutshell 
what is the message of the book primarily trying to convey? It's, it's not a, re, it's not a resolution book. You know, it doesn't say, Hey, do one, two, step two, one, two, three. It's not that it's, it's just, this book is to be relatable to really bring forward within our, within ourselves, whoever the reader is, just the behaviors that are contributing to this type of um, eating, overeating, binge eating, just that, those behaviors. And, and the words that we use, that we're saying to ourselves, we have an inner dialogue that's going on in our head. And if we realize, we start to become conscious about the inner dialogue, uh, we could start to transform things or we could start to say other things and bring some other words into our inner dialogue. We can more inform our bodies and inform our mind. Hey, you know, this is, let's look at it like this. Let's shift this, let's shift this wording. So it makes it more digestible. So what are some of the words that Gianna would say to herself to do this? One of the big things that she always says, it's a mantra, I call it a mantra. She always says, okay, no big deal. You know, like if there's something coming up and it's their feelings, right? It's really, she's trying to mask her feelings. She says, all right, no big deal. And she, uh, and like, cause in the back of her head, she can go and take care of herself by um, eating or, you know, taking herself away from the whole uh, process, taking herself away from the situation. Um, and, and the other thing is the other message in the book is that her life became about living outside of her body, right? She was outside of the container of her body. So a lot of this book is also trying to get into her body. It's easy if you're not in your body, it's easy to not have feelings. It's easy to not, you're not digesting. You're not digesting life. You're not digesting food. So you're, you're just disassociating basically. Disassociating. And what do you do to stop disassociating? Well, easy to say, I'm going to give you the overlay. You got to get, the goal is to get back in your body. So realizing, realizing that we're not in our bodies when we're you know, eating like this or and doing these behaviors, we're not in our body, so to speak. So we get to uh, we get to just see that sometimes. And is that painful? Something. Is that why people are avoiding it? Is painful to to be in your body and really um, be present with yourself? So Linda, I, I now think that it's a habit. I think it started out as protection from our child from our childhood, right? It could be it could be anything. It could have been someone talking loud around us. It could be someone saying something and we took it as criticism. So it's became a way to protect ourselves, you know, to walk away or not listen or tune ourselves out, and then. I, I actually think now that it's just, we think, or I think that the, the situation, a lot of times, depending on the words, is worse than it really is, right? So if we are anxious, if we just, you know, we hear this all the time, if we just settle into the anxiousness a little bit and see what's really creating the anxiety, it diminishes itself on some level, it could get, you know, on a scale of your, on a scale of one to 10 and your anxiety is at a nine and you are really, and, and you are, you're escaping it, but you don't really, you're not conscious that you're at a nine on some level, right? So you, the expectation of the anxiety is almost worse than having the anxiety. Right. And, and you're not if really in your body, you're, probably not really seeing yourself looking in the mirror if you're disassociating with your physical body right but you think but you but what happens is if we start to create stories about what is happening right then and there i mean it could be somebody just talking that has a loud voice i mean i'm just going to say that because a lot of people get you know triggered by loud voices right and then they start to apply oh they're they were they're yelling at me or they were doing this, but the truth is, 
the person just maybe had a loud voice. It just depends on how we're um, receiving we, it. We, we, we perceive the story yeah. after, at that point of the behavior that we're okay. not, we're walking away from or we're not trying to be present with. Okay. So and it's really about um, sticky, staying with the, and I think it has to be on some level, it has to be a real decision. You know, I'm going to, how am I feeling? You know what I mean? How am I feeling right now? How am I feeling? You know, we could keep asking that because we're checking out so many times during the day. Why do you feel uh -huh. like you did any disassociation with your body? How, let me count, <laughs> let me count the ways. Why did I do that? I thought that that was the best. I thought that that was, I didn't want to hear, I didn't want to hear uh, grownups around me telling me what to do. <laughs> so I would, I would just stop listening at an early age. I dissociated from the words that, you know, my parents were saying to me, other people were saying just, you know, so, but it eventually became a real habit. You know, I did a disservice to myself, you know, and I, it's, you know, it's been a, a long while spending time with myself to, to really, in order to stay present now, it's almost like a consciousness that I have to inform my body to stay present a lot of times. Uh, Sometimes so, it's a, something a lot deeper than that, that causes us to promote disassociation. I know that any trauma survivor, anybody out there that may have suffered from any type of sexual abuse, mm -hmm. har sexual harassment, um, mm -hmm. like uh, maybe emotional abuse even, it doesn't have mm -hmm. to be physical, usually disassociate Mm -hmm. uh, as a way of not having to feel the feelings that come up because of what mm -hmm. was going on. And it is definitely a protection. So mm -hmm. a lot of people out there can kind of probably relate right now to what you're saying mm -hmm. in one form or another about disassociation with themselves, but it really truly is a form of protection, like you said. Yes. What right. do you think that, uh, like you talk in your book about new goals, setting new goals, uh, loving not being there yet? I kind of really like that statement because I think most of the time we just want to be there and we hate the whole process of getting there. So how can we unpack <laughs> the loving not being there and powerfully reframe the getting there? You're so funny. Um, okay, so it's been a year of wanting to really get, now it's been my whole life of wanting to get there, right? Because the goal is to not have this, you know, relationship with food, but meanwhile, loving food so much, right? So how do we get there? Um, so, you know, I put myself in a situation in the past year of really looking at everything. So it's, I tell myself, I get to tell myself and remind myself that I'm part of a process. And it's not just here. It's not just with food. It's with everything. It's every single thing that, that I do because I'm a, you know, very task oriented person. A lot of us are, right? And so it's, I like to see things finished and get done, you know, right away. And when it comes to your emotional side of which, you know, I had to develop a lot of compassion for myself, you know, and I had to start using compassionate words. Oh my God, I didn't even know where they were. And so I developed a new vocabulary of compassionate words, like it's okay, you know, it's going to be all right. We're in the process. We're almost well, that's like parenting myself. yourself in a way yes, or giving yes. yourself what you never received or what you really need mm -hmm. by saying those things and giving mm -hmm. yourself what it is you need to receive. Right. And I think that um, we weren't taught. I think p children now are being taught this, but I think we weren't taught to how to modulate our emotions. You know, when we have feelings, what do we do with them? I was 
you know, in my world, we weren't really trained to speak our emotions or talk about our emotions or get in touch and, with them <laughs> or get or know what they are, you know, just if you're disassociating, feel... you're definitely not getting in touch with your emotions. Exactly. So we, so if you didn't have them and you just put them under the carpet, then what were we, you know, we didn't know what to do when we did have them and we did have a lot of them. Um, even, even the act of being stifled or, or being told, you know, don't speak or don't have emotions is an emotional, emotional situation. It's very, you know, like, it's very Yes, yeah, so it creates a lot of physical, um, you know, stuff in the whole body. And um, so you have to thing with that. And I think it's a lot of the times like what you were doing with yourself you, you may not have received that growing up. You may not have, because that's why you need it so much now, because it is something that we all need is words of encouragement and mm. um, positivity and cheering, you know, somebody like support, right? You're supporting yourself, you're cheering yourself mm -hmm. on. And, you, yes. and also equally, we have to, when we want something like being healthy or being in shape or just feeling better, it isn't an end game. It's a day game. You have to like oh, yeah. be is. in that process and you have to just do you daily that self care. Maybe we weren't taught that we should value ourselves in that way. And we don't realize that that's the whole process. It, it's, it's really when you are giving yourself that self-care, you're valuing you. Mm -hmm. If you say that's what you're doing, because you could still give yourself self-care and just still be disconnected from that too. I've, I've noticed that also. Um, and so it's a constant kind of acknowledgement to yourself, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's not outside. It's not just of you. taking a bubble bath. <laughs> right. It's not, not with the acknowledgement of yourself is not outside of you. It's really inside of you. And, you know, I think a lot of the struggle comes when we're, if we're searching outside of us for that. But the truth is that we're not even, even if somebody else was acknowledging us from the outside, we wouldn't, if we're just connected from our bodies, we wouldn't really take it in. We wouldn't be receiving that kind of um, acknowledgement, you know, because Pete, I mean, the world, the universe is always acknowledging us on some level. You have to give but yourself it's how approval. We, yeah. How are we and how, and how do we do it? Like, how are we taking that in? You know, I think it's a, another part of the process, another real conscious informing our bodies that we are, um, we are valuable. We are you know, whatever intelligent we we're are. worthy and deserving. Yes. We're mm -hmm. worthy and deserving. And mm -hmm. many times maybe we're receiving mis mixed messages in our life, mm -hmm. but just right. know that you are worthy and deserving. Um, right. why, why do you say that, uh, our intuition is like no one else's like, and how can we equip or or actually we're already equipped with the gut instinct, but how can we like tap into it and trust it? I have a really good intuition story. It wasn't, um, I was training my intuition my whole life, right? I was taking all these classes and uh, one day one of my employees was pregnant and she walked by me and I go, oh, by the way, you're having a girl. Just came out of my mouth. I was like, that was weird. I don't even know why. So she, she looked at me and she goes, uh, yeah, no, I'm having a boy. I had the exams and everything. And I go, um, okay. So of course I walked away because I didn't own my intuition yet. Right. I walked away and I was like, oh, why do I do that? I'm not going to forget my intuition. You know? <laughs> so, so sure enough, two weeks later, she had a girl <laughs> and she, they called me up and they're like, you're right all the time, everything was wrong. And so at that point, but that was like a gift to me, you know, because at that point I said, you know what, no matter what, it like, it just, 
may not may maybe it's not right in that particular moment. Maybe it's just not. But I'm just trust my intuition because it came from inside of me. Right? It came. I, I spent so much time yeah. developing it, and then I was going to make myself wrong. But it, and you get to see it once you own it. You get to see it playing out in the world, for and for yourself. It's like but, a knowing. You know, it's like yeah. um, it's hard to explain to anyone that hasn't really tapped in to their mm -hmm. intuition mm -hmm. for you, you know, but you're, it's almost like a knowing and nobody told you. <laughs> I mean, it's so right. weird. It's like this. Nobody, knowing. Mentioned, nobody mentioned intuition when you were growing up. No one said, trust your intuition. They never right? said, trust your intuition uh, or your gut. Um, your gut instinct is usually, I mean, 99.9% that first gut instinct is always right. Go with your mm -hmm. gut, believe and trust your inner knowing. I right. just believe that it was just put there by the creator and that it's mm -hmm. like, um, you know how we have a GPS. It's kind of like your internal GPS that is just telling you mm -hmm. when something's not right when you don't click mm -hmm. maybe you go to a doctor you don't feel heard you just don't have a good feeling about it go with the feeling because the feeling is telling you something and it's trying right. to save you from a world right. of heartache or right. it's kind of like that fear is there for a reason sometimes when you have a fear not always because a lot of fears are very irrational and it's false evidence appearing real but most of the time fear is just trying to protect us like where you've sensed something about somebody like danger and mm -hmm. you've got to listen to your instincts and the more you mm -hmm. lean in you the more you trust your instincts mm -hmm. the right. sharper they become i think i think i agree with you wholeheartedly and it depends on you know, different people experience intuition differently, right? Some people hear things. Um, some people really sense it, like you were just talking about, you're really feeling it. So I'm assuming you feel it in your gut, you, you feel things. And, um, and then some people just have a knowing. And when we start, and the, the, when, it, when it goes awry, I think is when we start, we hear something and then we start with the with the inner dialogue going doo, 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 you know what i mean and and some stories build up then we start to question our intuition but it is the first i agree with you it's the first feeling or sense or knowing that you have about something and the feeling and the knowing <laughs> yeah yeah and uh no well, you start to develop you start to develop other right you start to once you once you hone one aspect of it all the others start to to back you up on some level the other yeah. parts of you yeah so i just think it's just like this other sense that we have mm -hmm. that hasn't been addressed enough but i mm -hmm. really believe it's it's a reality i could tell stories for days on my intuition and how mm -hmm. how i feel like my intuition could slice a hair down the middle <laughs> wow pretty it's pretty like sharp and so you got to trust that when it comes right trust it right so if you're also, hearing it it's real <laughs> for right and for real for right <laughs> uh, um why do you say that our obstacles are working for us well huh because of course they are because you it's like the universe just went hey woohoo i'm right here and oh you didn't hear me the first hundred times i put something in front of you i'm gonna now put something else in front of you right now and you're really gonna hear me now and then we're gonna unravel everything so um i think that uh a lot of times our obstacles have shifted us into another direction and have That's made it. us yeah have made us um do things we never have just sent us on courses in life i mean look at i feel like life right now is happening so fast and there's so many obstacles going on right now that we never even imagined what what's happening right now we, like if we looked at it two years ago and saw what was going to happen we would have freaked out 
right? But we're here, we're handling it. Um, a lot of people, it wasn't, it wasn't a lot of good um, situations, but in those situations or in what was happening, um, life has taken us in another direction. You know, whether we became more introspective within ourselves or whether we became more connected. I mean, even though we were all disconnected, there were other ways to connect with other people. So I think that the big obstacle, you know, of this year um, is something that we're all working ourselves through. That's probably going to make us better inside. And I'm not talking about like if something horrible happened in somebody's family or um, that will never, you know, it won't be the same, but inside of us we are stronger we are more resourceful we are more introspective maybe we have a greater appreciation of life maybe we become more grateful in life um but i just think that other things bring us these situations that happen bring us to another part of our being that we weren't ever might not have gotten to faster what, what do you think it's done for you personally um, well, I think my just intention for myself, are we talking about this year? Are we talking about this my, year the struggles this year? Oh God. Um, I'm, <laughs> well, I'm on a podcast. I never felt <laughs> I'm doing an interview. I never would have done this. I never would have spoken about any of this. Um, you wouldn't have written your book. I might not have written that. I might not have probably not have written. A, I think I would have written a book, but I don't think I would have taken it as serious as I am taking it. You know, I'm really um, holding myself to the fire on this. And I, um, and I have a, you know, desire, I have a bigger desire to, to help more people and to really get messages out there for people to, um, really look at this in their life and help them transform or shift and just be grateful for themselves and in the, their bodies and uh, really get in their bodies. So, yeah, I mean, I had to write a book like this. You, I needed to, to walk the talk, walk the walk and <laughs> talk the walk, you know? Yes. So, um, yeah. So it's accountability right there. Oh yeah, yes. And um, so that's, it's been a huge year. It's been a huge year for me. Um, Love it. And kudos to you for writing your book and for uh, holding yourself, your feet to the fire, you know, because you're probably helping a ton of other people. And mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing with this year is realizing what matters and what doesn't. I think it really- oh, yeah. Uh, brings that to light in a, in a new and powerful way. Uh, you can deepen your connections with people, I think, instead of the opposite where uh, you're feeling alone. I think there's just so much good that could come out of it. Not necessarily somebody being sick, of course, like you said, but there, there, there is good in things if you look for the good it's certainly there and mm -hmm. i love this quote from joel osteen it's trouble is your transportation and i think many times it's the worst things we face that brought the best things later on to us mm -hmm. if we were to look back so i really uh think obstacles are for you and working through them is going to bring you to your greatest mm -hmm. potential right so what, true what what do you think um people can do to because i think this is a time that many people have went inward how can we learn to experience um the source, which I, you, you may call it the source. I call it God, the spiritual energy inside our bodies. Wow. I can't even believe you. I'm in the last three days. I have brought that into my life to really 
see how I really am experiencing your God. Um, and I, the first day I was doing, I'll be really honest with you right now. The first day I was trying, was experiencing the source and I was trying to, you know, get parameters around how to describe it and how to feel it. And um, I was so upset with myself because I was like, wait, I do this. This is what I do. And I couldn't, I just knew, I have a knowing that source is here and source is with me, but I was trying to take it to another level where I could fe really feel it in another way. And I'm still, I'll be honest with you, I am still investigating that for myself because I have a knowing, but I want to really experience the feeling of it. And I've been, you know, play, um, you know, I don't even know how to explain what I, what I, I can't even explain it right now because a knowing is, I can't translate a knowing to somebody else, right? Right. I can't translate that feeling. So I've been giving it descriptors, but the descriptors don't justify the knowing that I have inside. So I for think some it's people, just that yeah. I, I personally think that God writes his law on the inside of our hearts mm -hmm. and that it's in us, you know, already. And we just have to tap into that. And mm -hmm. um, right. So that's the question. What is that? So knowing that it's there and feeling your heart, right? Because it's brought me to my knees in the last few days, to tell you the truth. It made me, I, I, I cried when I thought of it, I, was, I cried, but I couldn't, I didn't have a tangibleness to it. I just felt the, the, the opening of my heart. So and that's the first step. That's the first step. Exactly. Um, so it's to be continued, I think, cause it's a, I think it's a never ending. It's there. Um, we feel it, we know it, um, many times but, because we've been closed off in other ways. Mm -hmm. That's why we aren't, we aren't able to tap into it, but you sound like you've been going through a lot of healing. And so you are ready to open mm -hmm. your heart. And I think that when we are ready to open our hearts that's when we mm -hmm. find that you know it is it is about it is about having that open heart mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for sure yeah so why, i think oh go ahead yeah that's that's um that is where the feeling comes from i agree with you yeah 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 now um why do you think women are especially good at creating food abusive relationships with themselves? Because they want a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and they know they want a relationship. <laughs> Let's say <laughs> they're honest. They're honest. They're, um, well, I think that women, uh, I think women's emotions are not black and white. No matter how, we, no matter, how, we could say they're black and white, but I don't think, I think there's a whole spectrum of possibilities of emotions inside of us, right? And so they need to be taken care of on some level. So if they're not, then we get to pick something, right? I mean, it will go true for anybody, but maybe men and i don't know if this is true maybe they simplify their emotions more um but women experience their emotions on a on a whole nother level or a whole nother spectrum so in that experience um they figure they the the the, the emotions that aren't getting taken care of are you know kind of put right in front of them and they're choosing food or they could choose alcohol. It doesn't need to be food. They could choose shopping. <laughs> it could be anything. They're, they're feeling like a void. They're feeling something's not there or something more gets to be happen here. And 
then there's a whole spectrum of what can be filled in, into that uh, arena of possibilities of emotions. What about the whole uh, body shame where, you know, as women were objectified on the regular or maybe body shamed? Um, there's definitely a conflict that all of us women have definitely went through on this scale. Mm -hmm. uh, speak to that a little bit and, and how have you um, come through or what, what have you had to deal with? Well, right. We have come to the point where we have looked at our bodies outside of our bodies, right? How society would like our bodies to be. And then we try to, we spend so much time trying to measure up, literally, <laughs> um, skinny up, diet up, you know, do everything to meet that vision like, you know, I think we're holding that vision for ourselves that we need to be like that. And I think our bodies, re our body resists on some level. We're we didn't ask our body. Our mind told us what, what the prerequisite was for our bodies to be. Um, so we spent our lifetime trying to be that. So I think Which is that exhausting. Point, <laughs> so exhausting all the time. <laughs> I think that so exhausting because do we need to learn one more diet because we could really all write the book on diets right we didn't we we get to ask ourselves what what is it it's you know, a fictitious it? thing in our heads yes, it's not, right you can never get like it's almost like the concept of you're not not good enough what if you don't have like what good enough is going to look like you're going to spend your whole life being like trying to be good enough right so if you have these visions of like this body and this body and this body, but it's not your own body, then you're going to spend your whole life trying to be that body. <laughs> and I, I could still relate to what you're saying, but in a different realm, it mm -hmm. was seeking my mom's approval, seeking her approval because I never felt that I truly had it growing up. So I did not recognize this in myself. Mm -hmm. In my personality test, it's always high achiever and right. no achievement is ever enough. I have to consistently be achieving it. It's like a drug. It makes me feel good. And, right. um, I I'm with you on that one too, by the way. <laughs> okay. I recognized it. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm 58 freaking years old and I finally, yeah. it like smacks me in the face around Christmas time. But it was something that I shared with my my family that was an accolade that not many people ever achieve in their life. And I wasn't doing it to brag. I was actually doing it so they would know they didn't have to worry. Uh, everything was great and they weren't going to have to worry. And it didn't go the way I expected. And mm. And then there were several other things that happened right before that were the same, the same. And I realized, oh my goodness, I have been mm -hmm. killing myself for this right. approval that I am never, ever going to receive. What sure. am I doing? <laughs> this, and it was like so freeing. And then I recognized I need to give that approval to myself. Mm -hmm. And that was such a thing that I think it's so eye-opening. And, and, and my mom is great. She loves me, but it was just this thing. It probably stems from the perfectionism that her mom held because she was a teacher. Right. And right. so like, it's not to, I definitely don't want to throw my mother under the bus or, or anything like that, but it is right. a reality that I think a lot of us face when maybe we didn't get approval or recognition or acknowledgement of mm -hmm. who we are as a person. I, I agree. I have a question though on that one. Um, so do we think that, so our parents never were intentionally disapproving of us, right? I, I don't think so. so. No, do they, I don't think they don't, she did so it on purpose. We, so we have a person in front of us 
that can't acknowledge, can't acknowledge because they don't acknowledge either themselves and they don't aren't acknowledge they're not that person right doesn't mean they're bad doesn't mean anything no, about exactly them. right so we're looking for something that is not this other person's not even able to give us right like we're going like we're barking up the wrong tree for what we're looking for right we went yes. in, we went in another direction for what we were looking for i didn't even level. realize i was looking for it that's the yeah. weird part that's how yeah. so disassociated or out of touch with yourself you could yeah. be not realizing i agree what you're looking for why yeah. you're looking for it until you do and then that's a gift that's a gift right. when you have the awareness then you can begin to change that narrative in your head that mm -hmm. you didn't even realize was there from childhood right and i suspect once you start once we start giving ourselves the approval that others will give us approval too it yeah. won't matter anymore though it won't it doesn't matter we don't that's need why. We, we don't need approval from outside but we'll start to hear it because even us as receivers of it which is what I was trying to say in the beginning is receiving it we weren't even probably without us having it inside of us which approval our own approvals inside of us we weren't able to receive that if we heard it well, like I recognize it in myself, if I could really be honest and look back, I can recognize the whole thing in myself about wanting to make my boss proud, wanting to yeah. make my husband proud, wanting to make people proud, you know, like, um, and, and that is all that whole, like, it's so many things. It's like the self-approval. It's like the... Uh, people pleasing. It's all those things wrapped into one. And I think just really unpacking those things gives you what you were looking for in the first place. You can give it to yourself. It's, yeah. it's a reality. Right. Right. So right. <laughs> yeah. Good. This is important. This is really, really important, important stuff. You know, this approval oh my gosh. thing. For it's really sure. true because because the truth is seeking approval does tie up a lot of energy energy that we could use towards something greater or some other thing yeah or yeah. you're just spinning your wheels for maybe you're spinning right. your wheels for something so hard it's, and it's it's you're, you're seeking something that you could just give yourself mm -hmm. you could and you could just realize yep. that person doesn't have it to give sometimes mm -hmm. They weren't yeah. giving it. They don't, they don't even know they're not giving it. Mm -hmm. So it's so many things, I think. Mm -hmm. And I also think that people don't intentionally do things like we are we set no. ourselves up to. Right. To it's say, not intentional. Oh, did you hear oh. what they said to us? Or did you hear what they, they did to us? Or, or they don't even know, hear however, themselves and know what right, they're saying. However we, hold, however, we hold all that. And it's not really true. People not necessarily come after us in a you know to hurt us or in a disapproving way or um it just this is the way they are this is the way they are in life and it doesn't right. even have anything to do with us half the time so we could stop spinning our wheels there too <laughs> right like what the personal uh the four agreement says don't take any the fourth one i think is it might be the fourth one. I know it's one of the agreements not to take anything personally because it yeah. isn't personal. Right. Well, this exactly. has been so, so good today. Uh, where can everybody get your book and reach you on social media and also your course? Yeah. So um, I have a website and it's called Isabel, I-S-A-B-E-L dash Chiara, C-H-I-A-R-A.com. And there's a free chapter download that's up. So everybody that's listening can go on um, the website and just grab the free chapter. And I think that you're going to have it underneath the podcast too. Um, and I have a membership site, which is uh, healing activation process integrations, where um, it takes you through a lot of process. So you could do your own inner work and really shift a lot of perceptions that you have in your life. And um, 
that it's we call it the happy process. And um, so that membership site is up on my website also. Um, so it's isabel chiara c h i a r a dot com. And I just want to thank you, Linda, for the work you're doing and just the beautiful interview that we had today. It's been great. I love it. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And your I questions really... were so inspiring and oh. made me really go deep with you. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I said I really yeah. like to do that. And I think mm -hmm. that's what actually is life changing for everyone mm -hmm. out there is when we show up as our real, true, authentic selves. So I thank mm -hmm. you for showing up as yourself real vulnerable and just with a heart to help others mm -hmm. thank you yeah and thanks everyone for listening to this episode of the sisterhood of sweat let us know what your takeaways were uh, how you feel if you have anything to add to the conversation and be sure to follow isabel on social media we'll leave it in the show notes Bye, everyone.